Well, hello, I'm Debbie Kitterman, and welcome to Dare to Hear the Podcast, where we equip you and challenge you to dare to hear the voice of God. Well, we are in week four of Becoming the Bride series. I've got Amy Rogers here with me. Today, we're going to talk about removing the squatters. But if you've missed any of our episodes, I really want to encourage you to go back because this is week four. So we've started a brand new series called Becoming the Bride. But if you missed our summer series, it was about equipping whipping the bride. And we went for, I don't know, nine or 10 weeks in that series. Um, the, the whole month of, um, July was about quipping the bride. And then we had spiritual warfare in August, four different parts about that. And then I really felt like the Lord was saying that he really wanted, um, us to stop hearing everything and start doing something with it. And so one of the things that he challenged me to do was, um, what would it be to become the bride and what can I do to activate us in becoming the bride? Not just listening to the podcast, but actively doing something with what you hear. And so, you know, me activation queen each week, I've had some pretty serious, tough questions uh, for you to take before the Lord so that you can begin to step out in whatever that topic is and do what God is asking you to do. And so Amy, I couldn't think of anybody else to have this conversation with. Um, and so she has been gracious enough to be with me over the Equipping the Bride series and Becoming the Bride series. And we're not sure how many more episodes we're going to have. We've been lining them out. We know what our last one's going to be, but we're still looking for what to fill in the gap. But right now we're at week four. So. Amy Rogers is a lover of Jesus Christ. She's a mom of four. She's called to um, just be raw and real. That's her ministry. That's who she is. That's what God has called her to be. And she really has a passion to uproot things and to plant and build the things of the Lord. So uproot those things that aren't of God and plant and build things that are. And we have similar giftings and similar callings, but yet they're different. And and we work so well together and we see things similarly, but like I said, differently. And so that's what I think makes this a great conversation, Amy, is because we um, bounce things back and forth with each other and we get revelation from one another and we build on that and we complement each other in the way that it's supposed to be within the body of Christ. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I love that because... It, I love how our differences are actually complementary and not in um, rivalry. And I think that's what, you know, the Lord really wants to put on display right now. And that's how we work in unity. You know, we talked about that yeah. and, um, and that's how we move forward. That's how we, you know, utilize um, being the body of Christ, the one singular body and bride. Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. And this week, um, this week's podcast episode, Remove the Squatters, we're going to take a look at Nehemiah um, because there's been a lot of warfare. I've shared a little bit over um, the course of the Equipping the Bride series and even some with this. And then with the personal ministry update that I did in September um, and you know, I remember saying to you, and I've said this on the podcast before, like you keep saying you're pioneering, Debbie, just remember that. And I'm like, pioneering sucks. <laughs> like I, you know, and I'm not running from it as a young, immature believer who realized finally what God had called me to. I mean, I would take those personality tests and I'd take those things and I'd be like, nope, not a builder, not a pioneer, not a trailblazer. And I would answer the questions in such a way so that those didn't come up as part of my personality test. Yes, you can cheat those. Um, not that I knew that I was cheating them, but I definitely was not going to come into an alignment agreement. And when we were talking about bridal identity 2.0 at the end of the podcast episode, man, I, okay. I listened to that again, man, I was on fire at the end of that. When I was talking about the name that God had called us and what's the name change that we have. And, and there's something Amy about partnering with who God has called you to be and owning it and not making excuses for it and stepping fully into that. And I have just kind of been thinking about that since, you know, we recorded it and then I re-listened to it and then we're continuing to record the series. And I was like, huh, 
Interesting that we're going to be talking about Nehemiah. Interesting that he's a builder um, because there's certain things that my family's been contending for certain things that he's called God has called us to build. And it always seems like every time we step out to do something God has called us to do, it's like the enemy sucker punches us. It's like, woo, like, yes, we're warring. Yes, there's intense battle, but we're still pushing forward. And just when you think you've overcome all the obstacles out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And that's where we find, you know, um, Nehemiah. And we're going to talk about that. I was um, rereading Nehemiah because he's so good. John did a, a sermon series on Nehemiah. And today we're going to talk about the uh, Sanballat's Tobias and the Geshems. And every time he would say that in his sermon series, this, this is how this is stuck in my head. He would do, he would tell the people, okay, if I say Sanballat or Tobiah or Geshem, you need to go dun, 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 right? Because... <laughs> So I was like, oh, I need that sound effect on my soundboard, but I didn't have time to figure that one out. So um, Nehemiah was a builder. He was called of God to do it, but really he was a cupbearer when he got this call or this anointing from God. And so there's so many things that I want to talk about today with Nehemiah, but I think I want to just kind of turn it over to you because this was what you were really passionate about that came out of um, our after hours talk, um, from the bridal identity 2.0. So, yeah, I think, I mean, we all love the, you know, prophetic words and the dreams and the build, I want to build and, and all of that. And yet the way Nehemiah kind of stewarded, I think you and I have kind of both been anchored in that for quite some time that he was doing what God had called him to do at the very beginning. He was the cupbearer to the king. It was a humble position, and yet it's one of honor. Mm -hmm. And um, and then he gets this call, this news, where it threw him into this travail and intercession. He wasn't doing that to become the answer and solution for these people it just broke his heart because those were his people. And he was calling out to God, like, God, surely there's somebody. Oh yeah. I'm going to send you Nehemiah. And I think we all want to be sent too, but there's something about the posture that I think the, the true bridal identity is, and that is the humility. We've already talked about that. It is, you know, going into a place of intercession and travail without this alternative or this um, ult um, ultimatum or this idea that, you know, we're going to step in and save the day, right? It's, Lord, I'm just going to travail and I'm going to intercede so that you will, and I can partner together so that you can enact your plans, right? I'm going to call your will to be done here on earth. And then comes God's, you know, command, like, I'm going to give you favor with the king. And, and he did. And the king was like, yep, you can go. Um, but the way Nehemiah kind of slow walked it, he didn't go charging in like, Hey, I'm here to, you know, like mighty mouse here. I am to save the day. You know, he didn't do that. It was this quiet arrival and he didn't tell anybody why he was there. That's, I think I love that the most about that beginning part of the story he wasn't there putting on blast, like why he was there. He didn't put on blast that the king had favor for, you know, for him. He didn't put on blast that God anointed him to come do this. Right. You know, it was in the middle of the night that he walked around the wall and he talked with the Lord about what are we, what am I doing here? You know, what is your plan and, and we know the story, right? He was there to rebuild the wall. That was the passion because there were squatters that had invaded inside the walls. They had taken up residence inside the walls of this nation, God's people. And this is really where we wanna hover because what are the squatters that we have allowed in our own personal lives? And then that again, translates into us as the corporate church remnant and bride so who are the squatters what are they how do we handle them 
And so that's what we're going to un- unpack. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because that's one of the things that I've always said to people too, is, you know, when God's given you an assignment or there's something that he's birthing in you, or he's wanting you to build that you need to be very careful about protecting that and who you share it with, but you do need to share it with somebody. And, you know, we've been talking and I've said this, Like we've been talking about these topics for more than a year, but we did talk about Nehemiah. Um, Several people did at the dream big with God seminar, one day seminar that we did a year ago. And I find it really funny, ha ha, you know, not really, but interesting, funny that God is bringing this back around because there's something on this in this season for the people of God. Um, you know, I mean, it's it, the, at the time of this recording, you know, we, it's the political season. Uh, we haven't really got as close to, you know, the election day as, you know, when this is going to come out, but, but you can feel it in the atmosphere. You can sense some stuff in the atmosphere and yet God is still calling his people. I haven't changed my mind about what I've called you to do. It, the terrain may look a little bit different, but I'm still calling you to step out. And when I begin thinking about like squatters, I mean, we all have this, this idea of squatters. I mean, When we lived in Olympia, the first house that we lived in for 18 years, at the end, towards the end of our season of living there, in fact, it was one of the things that spurred my husband to say, I'm done living here, um, was there were people that were squatting in the house behind us and they turned it into a drug house and they were all squatters. Um, and, And so when we think about squatters, we think about it in that context, right? In the context of somebody living on a property that they don't own, um, without permission and they're living there rent free. And so I want you to think about that definition in the natural of a squatter but when you allow people to squat in your life they are living rent free in the space that god has called you to occupy and some of these things are people individuals that you're allowing to be connected to you or be in your space and they're also um spirits or things that we haven't dealt with or the enemy coming at us and we have to be proactive we've gotten the tools that's why we're becoming the bride right because you actually have to do something with the tools that you've been given to um, be equipped with and so when we look at nehemiah he was just okay i'm in captivity i'm serving the king i'm cupbearer to the king and something in him broke when he got the report of what was happening in his home nation the walls were desolate they were broken and he started weeping like lord do something it was almost like when i was rereading it was like almost like the isaiah moment like isaiah what was me who are you gonna you know who are you gonna send lord oh wait me um that we see that nehemiah is just like god what's going to be done and god's like well actually i'm you know I'm, t- I'm tapping you. It's your turn. You're going to go. And he's like, I'm just a cupbearer to the king. In fact, chapter one ends with a cupbearer to the king. Yeah. But God gave him favor to do that. And, and I want us to think about, like, in our own lives, like, what, what or who are the people that might be living rent free in a space that God has called us to occupy because we're unwilling to occupy that space. Um, you know, I, it goes to stewarding. It really goes to stewarding, right? So let's talk about that. Let's just start there. I think that's a great jumping off point. Um, because you know, we're called to steward the call upon our lives, right? He was a cupbearer to the King. So he's stewarding this. He's taken off into captivity. He's still given a place of, I mean, in the king's court, um, kind of a prestigious thing, I guess, unless the king gets poisoned and then you die. But but he had favor with the king. And so he's stewarding the call that was on his life at the moment, but there was a bigger call upon his life that God had plans for him to go back to rebuild the walls around the people and the nation. And This goes to stewarding our relationships too. We have to steward our life. We have to steward our calling and we have to steward our relationships. 
Yeah, I think um, I think we always have to start at that micro level before we can expand it out to the macro level, right? Yeah. And so I, when I was thinking about this as well, I'm like, okay, so who are the Tobias, the Gashems, and the Sam Ballots that are in my own life? You know, and I think sometimes we kind of glaze over the fact that maybe some of those squatters in our own lives are our own you know, refusal to deal with some things that we know need to get healed. You know, maybe it's a, you know, a crack in our glasses of perspective over things. Maybe it's our, you know, some tethers to some religious things that we aren't quite ready to deconstruct from. Um, You know, I think it um, can be disbelief over things. I think it can be fears. I think there's a lot of things in our own personal like hearts and our own personal mindsets that can actually squat, take up space and sabotage Mm -hmm. us as a person that would actually cause us to not even step into that place to begin to build. And, and we know the story with Nehemiah, you know, it was building and it was warring. And, and I think if we're battling with these squatters in our own personal lives, it won't allow us to deal with the relationships that we need in our lives. And therefore, if it's all unhealthy and we have all these squatters, we are going to spend more time warring things we were never meant to war and less time building what we are called to build. Mm -hmm. And so there's this balance that has happening. There's this balance of this that we see in the story of Nehemiah that I think we really need to kind of look at and overlay on that micro level with ourselves and then let it expand out as God wants to walk you through it. Um, But I also do think that a big part of that, yes, it's our healing, but it's definitely relationships. And, um, and I really think that, um, I mean, cause we talked about the dartboard relationships and all of that stuff, but really when it comes to this conversation and discussing the Nehemiah story, you know, we've talked about this, um, behind the scenes. And I think this is really, um, what we need to do because Nehemiah put everybody together in families. And I think that's really, um, important that we talk about this because it wasn't Nehemiah's fan club, right? Fan clubs will never be family. Mm -hmm. Fan clubs will always be the squatters Mm -hmm. because the squatters are wanting supplies from you. They're not wanting to reciprocate. And so there's this war that happens when wrong relationships are squatting behind the walls you are to be building. So I really just kind of felt like that's, you know, we have those relationship figured out once we're dealing with this micro what's going on with me what altar do i need to build where do i need to get healed um what are some things i need to let go of what tethers to to some man-made religious stuff have i been holding on to because it's uncomfortable you know so this is kind of those questions that i kind of felt like i needed to ask everybody like what do we need to deal with so what are those personal squatters in my own heart um that i need to deal with so that it can expand out and deal with the ones that are out here as well Mm, that's really good you know i when i was reading in nehemiah i just kind of like looked up and you know me i that's a teacher in me i like to do the research and so i was like okay who are these squatters who are these people and really where did they come into play and it's interesting that Before you get very far, I think it's in chapter one and in chapter two, it says this a couple times that Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem were upset that Nehemiah was coming to rebuild because they had free reign of coming and going and doing whatever they want in a land that really wasn't their own. But who really were they? Um, So they're enemies of the they were enemies of the Jews, but really they were part of the people group that God actually kicked out of the promised land way back when um, Joshua was taking the Israelites into the promised land. And so these guys had already been kicked out. And so they're trying to come back in. And so when we're talking about who are the squatters, these are those things too those those tapes that play over and over in our mind. I mean, I just, you know. (laughs) <laughs> was saying to Amy, like, I took this huge step of faith of what God is calling us to do. And then two seconds later, I'm like, 
What if they deny me? What if they say you can't do that? Oh my gosh, why did I do that? I shouldn't do that. I should just stop. And these are not even the way I think all the time, but it was just like, I was assaulted with these squatters that were wanting. It was like, it was like a woodpecker pecking at my brain. Like, let me in, give me access, give me access. And I said to Amy, oh my gosh, this needs to stop and talk me off the ledge. Um, and you know, that happens to all of us. And so we need to realize that there are enemies, like the scripture says, the enemy is looking to see who he can kill, steal, and destroy. He's looking to devour us. And how does he do it in the subtle ways? He sends people to mock us or taunt us or to intimidate us or deceive us or give us false reports, right? Like I didn't even need anybody to come give me a false report. My brain was trying to do it all on its own. You know, who do you think you are? Why do you think you should be doing this? Why do you think they should accept you to do this? I mean, the struggle is real, people. But that's why we're told, and we talked about this in Equipping the Bride. We talked about that we have to take every thought captive. We have to take every thought captive, submit it to the obedience of Christ. We have to get the mind of Christ. And in order for us to remove the squatters from our life, we have to do the same thing because We've already got things kicked out of our lives, but the enemy is always looking for an open door. He's always looking to slip through a back door. He's always looking for a weakness in the wall, if you will, to get in. And I mean, I, I love to what you, you said about, um, you know, he, he, Nehemiah surveyed the wall at night, so nobody knew what he was really doing. And yet, even though people didn't know what he was doing, yet the Sanballats, the Tobias, and the Geshems already knew he was coming, already knew he was there. And they were waiting for him because they didn't like, because he was disrupting their status quo and where they had access to. And and we need to realize that that we've been in our inability to remove the squatters from our own lives. Um that we have been allowing people access to live in our space rent free. I, I have shared this before, Amy. I'm a recovering recovering people pleaser. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, just when you think you've overcome it, you get an opportunity to realize I got to remove that again. But but with this, we we allow people individuals into our space to tell us what to do or we do what we think they want us to do because we want to keep everything on the up and up peaceful yeah instead of doing what we know we're called to do that was me <clears throat> that was me uh, I mean I have had some people in my life that I was not strong enough to stand up to until I got enough healing. And then when I got enough healing and I said, mm, nope, I'm going to make my own decisions now. Thank you for telling me what I think, but I know what I think and I'm strong enough now to stand up for myself. And let me just say it didn't go over very well. No, no. When you, when you start putting up those walls, you know, let's just call them boundaries. That sounds better. You yeah, know, boundaries. when your healed self starts creating the healthy boundaries that you need in order to continue to walk forward in the very things that God is calling you into, the squatters will start getting uncomfortable. You're cutting off their supply, right? Because you've realized that they could only journey so far. They've only, they've only been able to journey with you up to this point. After this point, they are now, it's not that they're bad. It's just the the position that they are in in their journey, and it doesn't align with yours right now. And this is how we have to discuss, you know, as we become the bride, we don't isolate and we don't alienate, um, but we release in love. It's not a discord. Now, some people might just get ticked off and go the other way. That's their issue, not yours, yeah. as long as it's done right. But when you begin to create those healthy boundaries of removing access to the plans of God over your life, they will get riled up, right? And remember, it's spirit, not a person. And so, you know, you're dealing with a lot of these things and it is disrupting the status quo. And I think that's one thing that we are going to have to just 
settle ourselves in and just get comfortable with that as we walk forward as the bride under the mantle and the the anointing that the bride is being called up into we are going to disrupt every bit of every status quo of everything in our lives mm-hmm. okay it's going to tick off all of the things that were once comfortable <clears throat> right? The Sambouts, the Tobias and the Geshems, they were getting free meals. They had a place to stay. I mean, they, they were harassing the people that were still trying to live there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were good as gold, right? Yeah. But it wasn't what those people needed. They were disrupting their status quo. And so they needed a leader to come in and say, yep, no more. We're going to create some boundaries. We're going to build this wall. You know, and I'm just going to say, I mean, I I joke about being a recovering people pleaser as well, but I always kind of think I was a little bit more of an undercover people pleaser because I always kind of had the attitude of like, I don't care if you don't like me or not, you know, but deep inside, I'm like, oh, but I want everybody to like, you know, but I was not going to bend too much, you know, but I did have those people pleasing um, nuisances and things that might redirect um, myself and my path into a way that may, you know, that caused some compromise. And so I was more of a covert people pleaser. So I'm speaking to all y'all out there too. So, you know, we're all, we're not all just, you know, up front and, and all that about it. Some of us are a little bit more, you know, um, hidden about it, um, because we have that, I don't care attitude, um, about some things, but in actual reality, we care a lot. Not. And, um, and so it's difficult when you finally have some people that are in your walls and now you're being led into a place where God's saying, I need you to build a boundary between you and this relationship. And you're like, but, 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 but they like me and they're supportive and, you know, all these things. And, you know, and so that's, that's going to be conversations that you have with the Lord, but it is necessary. Mm-hmm. It, again, I'm going to say it again. It is not because they are bad. It's not because they are even parasitical. It is just where they are at in the journey. And God is showing you something that is difficult to look at. They just can't stay on the same path with you. They can't step into this familial relationship to war alongside you and to build with you because there's something about them and their journey, again, not judging, where these relationships that are going to be warring next to you and building with you, they have to be your biggest champions. They can't have envy or jealousy or competition or anything like that about them if they're going to war and bleed alongside you they can't have that if they're going to catch the vision with you and build right and they're going to help you with strategy which means correction Mm -hmm. and there are people outside of this you know, boundary line, these squatters, they don't have the capacity or capability to step into the place that you need in order to enact God's plans for your life. Yeah, that's so good, Amy. It's so good because I think we all have some of that people-pleasing tendencies within us to some degree. Some are more healed than others. Some are more covert than others. Um, I tended to have a lot of controlling people come around me. And that was a thing that I would rile against in my own life because I didn't want to be controlled. I was rebellious. I had like and why I let these people come in and tell me what to do and what I'm like, Lord, man, I was broken. I was broken. But I mean, I think it goes to what we talked about, about who's your captor in week nine um, under the weapons of warfare, that we have to recognize what is holding us in captivity and what is holding us back. And I think what I love about Nehemiah is that he realized, wait a second, I am in captivity, but I've been given a seal of approval from the king who's brought me into captivity to restore my nation, to build the wall. And so I don't have to put up with you people, you know, you're our enemies, but guess what? The king, he sent me here. So go on your way. But the other thing too, when you read Nehemiah is that they kept coming back multiple times. 
Mm -hmm. They taunted, they gave false reports, they would say things as if they were true. So we have to be discerning people. We have to pay attention to what's going on. And, you know, when you were talking, it reminds me of, I think it's T.D. Jakes, because I want to give credit where credit's due, because how we started this whole series off was this spiritual plagiarism. Don't get me started, because that's a whole nother soapbox. Um, But... I think it was T.D. Jakes and he, and it was really at a time when um, I was with my friend in California, Ruth. And she said to me, she said, Debbie, you need to listen to this teaching. And it was like eight, eight minutes right now. I know a lot of things have come out about T.D. Jakes and all of that, but listen, God's anointing and his calling are still irrevocable. Even if people choose to do some things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and that's for anybody. So we take the good and we hold on to it. But this came at such a pivotal time in my life when I had, uh, stood up for myself finally. And, um, you know, said, no, you're not going to control me. And no, I'm going to do this. And this is what God has called me to do. And it broke that relationship because the person couldn't well, if you won't let me control you, like, what's the point of this? And I was like, what? Because I was setting healthy boundaries. Um, and she said, you need to listen to this. And TJ Jakes has, I think it's like, you can, the the snippet version is like eight minutes, but he talks about constituents, confidants, and comrades, and how each of those are in your life. These people are in your life for different things. Some are going to be your cheerleaders. Some are going to help you build something in a specific season. And then some are going to be your ride or die people. Um, and, and sometimes we think everybody's our ride or die and they're not our ride or die. I would say of some of the relationships that I saw um, in church ministry, probably the last 10 years before we moved out of Washington state, I would say they would have been my ride or die people. Some of these are 10 year relationships or longer that I realized they're not my comrades. They are not my confidants. And they're not. And I was keeping them there and allowing them in that space. And it was holding me back. And then they weren't bad people. They weren't. But their inability to get their own healing and to let go of control and manipulation in their own life. That was my, that was my why I always attract those people, Amy, I have no idea because I am not about manipulation and I'm not about control. Those are two things that drive me crazy, but those things attract to me like nobody's business. I've learned to be discerning, but, but in that I realized, wait a second, like, this has to change in my life. I was allowing them there and it was holding me back from building and moving forward and pioneering and recognizing and accepting and stewarding the call that God had had on my life. And I think this is what the San Ballas Tobias and the Geshams do. They might have different names. There could be some spiritual stuff attached to it, but they're there nonetheless. Um, I want to talk about relationships and families, but before I do that, I want to just give you a chance to respond to that because I think that, um, I think that we all have to take a hard look at, you know, you talk a lot about the dartboard. You talked about that in the dream big, um, seminar that we did a year ago, which was, is so good. It's so good because it's so important. Right. Um, so I want you to address anything that I just said there, and then we're going to switch topics to. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, I think our biggest battle is this, is that we will acknowledge the squatters that are within the walls. Right. And, and so we acknowledge it and we're like, get out. You don't have any space here. And then we start going about our business and then they come back. Like you're saying they come back. But I think sometimes because we think we're in a new season when we're really not, you know, call it ignorance, call it another layer that needs healed for us. We actually invite them back in. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really where we have to, really put our faces, you know, set our faces as flint, right? Like understanding that we are in a very, we talk about the times and seasons of God. We are in a lengthened season of God right now. And I think we're going to see some overlapping of some things. And in this, is this, we're building, you know, just again, overlay Nehemiah's story. We are building a wall, and, and we are building what God is setting our hands to this God vision in order to become the bride, becoming 
you know, that place for him to, to come back for the bridegroom to come back and set his foot down. And we can't do that proper if we keep inviting back in what we just kicked out. We are all guilty of it. Mm -hmm. I've lost count of how many times I have, you know, and it's, but it's really in that pulling everything we talked about from the equipping the bride, our discernment, it's the weapons, it's all of the things that we've been equipped with to become the bride, to understand the time and season we are in and understand that we cannot keep inviting the squatters back into our lives. They will hinder us. They will create more battles than we were meant to fight. And if we are supposed to be building, we can't be spending all of our time warring. We will have battles that we have to fight as we build, but why are we going to add to it? Well, it's because it feels good. I want that relationship in, or I want this here or this here. Well, I'm sorry, but as we're becoming the bride, we don't get to dictate to God who he is saying to kind of set aside, saying what to set aside. Um, and how to build. We have to follow his instruction. And I will say this until I go home, our obedience will take us places where our flesh does not want to go. This is more altar building than anything at any other point in our life. If we truly are going to become the bride and build with God, we are going to have to be very uncomfortable. Yeah. And we have to acknowledge that the only one that we need affirmation from is the one who has anointed us to be here at this moment of time. He will bring us people, you know, and, and like, for me, I was fine with having nobody on my dartboard, right? Because I had controlling people trying to come into my life. Well, they learned real fast. They can't control me. And I always joke, well, my parents couldn't even control me, you know, because I was a rebellious child. And, and yet the Lord was like, I'm like, well, Lord, you're the only one that can because I'm surrendered to you, right? But there had to be this point where I had to be softened enough to, to discern that he was actually bringing me people to put into my walls, inside my walls, be a part of that family building. And I had to be soft enough to, um, to allow those in, but I had to also discern which ones were legit and pure and proper versus the ones that would have been squatters and creating more battles for me than I ever wanted to fight. Yeah, that's so good. I'm telling you discernment is so important because I have been caught unaware and letting too many people inside the walls that didn't belong inside of the walls because just because <laughs> we're yeah. going to stop there before I say anything else. Um, I want to talk about, I, I want to talk about the family unit and I want to talk about, um, also asking God to edit our relationships. So remind me of this. Sometimes I get carried away and I go on a rabbit trail, but remind me of the editing relationships. Cause it goes to my, my homework assignment for the activation for today. But I want to talk about this in this season it's a really weird season. This year has been a really weird year for me and my family. Um, and just, it's like, I feel like the Lord, you know, my word for the year was, um, you know, may you prosper as your soul prospers, get healthy, do it. I'm like, God, okay, I got it. Right. But, but it's not just, it's not just emotional. It's, it's the physical, get your body in order, get your house in order, like all of that. And, um, you know, and then he spoke to me, we were coming down to like the end of the remnant, which was two years, which I love that group. I love that group. I love and miss you guys. Um, but you know, and everybody, there was people waiting to get in to the next year of the remnant. And the Lord clearly spoke to me. I want you to take the summer off and I want you to take your family through your prophetic classes because they had been asking about it. Right. My sister, my niece, my son, my daughter-in-law, my daughter, like that, that were, and my mom, they're all part of the class that we've been doing. And I was like, okay. And then the last part was in minister to your family this summer. I kind of grew, and I've talked about this. I kind of grouped those all together, like taking your family through your prophetic classes and minister to them. Cause that's what I do. 
it was a lot more than that, right? It was a lot more than that. And, and I was, I was kind of reminiscing with somebody, um, in right, right around Labor Day, really about, about if I knew, and I've, I've said this before, if I knew what God was really saying, <laughs> I don't know. Um, because he had me really take the summer off. I didn't do the remnant. I put that on hold. I was planning on starting it back up in the fall. I, already was going to do another possessing your promises seminar in November. I was already going to do that. Like those things were on the books. And then the Lord said, Nope, I don't want you to do that. I'm like, but you said summer, you know, my husband was joking. Well, summer technically isn't over until the middle of September when we switch into fall around the 20th or the 22nd or something like that. I was like, Oh, stop. The kids are back to school. It's fall. Um, although we have fake fall here in the South. So, you know, take it for what it is. But I, I was talking to somebody and they were asking me about this. And I said, I said, there has been incredible breakthrough though in our family. Had I not taken the time to really do what the Lord said of investing in your family and ministering to your family, there's been breakthrough. And yet there's still war. There's still battles. There's still warfare. There's still things going on, but out of my mouth, Amy, I said this, and I think it really ties really well into the Nehemiah story that the Lord was really talking to me about ministering to my family first, because it sets the precedent for further ministry to other people. And that it sets a foundation really of moving forward, that if I can't steward my family, well, if I can't minister to my own family and take care of what God is talking to me about in my own life, then how am I ever going to be entrusted to serve and care? and minister to other people. And so when I was rereading um, the story of Nehemiah in Nehemiah 4.13, it says this, um, you know, it's really kind of talking about the sand ballots and they're getting really upset and all this stuff. And the wall was rebuilt until it reached the height for the people to work, you know, certain height. And then you come to verse 13 and then he says, um, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall, but I did them in family units. I posted them with their families, with their swords, spears, and bows. So some were working with a sword in one hand and working with the other, and some were just guarding their families, and some were being with their families because the Sanballats, the Tobias, and the Geshems were coming at them, and they were starting to attack them and taunting them, and the family units had to rally around each other. And I really got to thinking about this. You know, they always, you know, I've been in church ministry since time I was in my twenties, actually before that, just not with an official title, I had official titles in churches and I worked on staff at churches before that I worked in children's ministry. I did VBS. I did all kinds of stuff. I was director for all kinds of things as teenagers and you know, all that, but officially in church ministry. And they always said, okay, God first, then family and then ministry. That's what they said. It's not what they meant because they really meant ministry first and whatever we need, of course, it's going to be in line with God. So God and ministry are right there. And then your family's come and, and, and that really bothered me. Right. It really bothered me. And so when we stepped into pastor, I didn't want my kids to be like a PK kid. I didn't want them to have that kind of thing. Um, you know, when John and I stepped in, they were in their teenage years, so they didn't have the whole growing up years. I mean, I, but when they went to school, I started working at a church, you know, when Brandy went to kindergarten, I started working on staff at a church. So I've been in ministry, but not in that kind of official where they would be called PK kids until they were teenagers. Um, and, and it really bothered me that we would say one thing at one side of our mouth, but expect something completely different. And yet that in our brokenness, we allowed it to happen. All of us did. All of us that were on staff at the, that church allowed it to happen at other churches allowed it to happen. And that when we really think about it, yes, God first, 
then family, and then ministry, that that's the proper way that God has set things up is that we love him with all of our heart, right? And that we have our family unit. And here's what we see is Nehemiah has his family unit that comes um, around. And the Lord just really started talking to me that as I set my family as a priority, as, and, and I've said this to many people, family comes first. Like they'll say something to me like, oh, Debbie, I, I'm sorry, I have to, I can't do this. And I'm like, family comes first. I do really mean that. Like if you're having to step down because, and you've already said yes to this and you're having to pull back because it's a family thing. I get that. You have to put family first. Um, and so this has been a season where I'm scratching my head, like, okay, God. Okay. Because, you know, not able to do the fall seminar, not doing the possessing the promises. The Lord said, Nope, you need to hold off on that. He's given me a couple of other assignments. The podcast is one of them. Um, and, and yet it's because he's saying you need to continue to minister f for, to your family. You need to be present for your family, for whatever's going on, whatever I'm calling you to do. You need to set the foundation and the precedent mm -hmm. that families are together and ministry will come out of that. And, it's been interesting. And that's what we see here with Nehemiah is that he's positioned them around the wall to continue to build and war because they were protecting and because they were under attack in family units. And I think that speaks volumes. So what would you like to say about that? Yeah. I mean, they were shoring up the walls in order to protect them from future battles right? That's what the walls around the cities were for. It was a fortress. It was a fortitude, you know, a, a way to just detract the enemies from coming in. And the fact that the families were doing that together says so much to me, you know, I mean, we've all been dealing with something within families. I think, I, I think you and I both personally yeah. have been, but I think we can probably confidently say that across the board, that many people have had a lot of disruptions and um just changes that have happened in familial relationships and you know i i can attest to that with you know my kids um you know the lord gave me this really great picture i mean we've been dealing with a lot of stuff you know and you know he just reminded me you know you are the parent you're going to be together and and you know you're not the savior right that's powerful and he gave me this picture standing on this beach and he said, you know, the waves are coming, you know, the waves are going to hit. And as their mother, you can stand with them there on the shore and hold their hands and help them not get knocked over by the waves, but you can't prevent the waves from coming. Mm. See, this is how families stand together. And if I was focused on other things, I wouldn't be focused on making sure that my children and I all are able to stand as the waves come, as the enemy attacks, as this, as that, right? And I know I'm uber sensitive about family being first because of my upbringing. You know, I was a PK, you yeah. know, I was the preacher's kid. My dad was a very broken man. You know, things, life was good and, and reconciliation happened, but he was a broken man when he was a pastor. And we were always left to feel as though we got the scraps, if anything at all. It was last place all the time. The people of the church were always first, church, 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 church. You know, every time the doors were open, we were expected to be there and we were expected to be on, you know, all this stuff. And so there, it became, as a young child, this picture of you play this part, but nothing was real. And so I questioned a lot about how important is family to God, right? And I'm looking and I'm reading in the scriptures as this young 10, 11 year old kid trying to understand the word of God. And I'm like, and all I read was family, 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 Abraham, father of nations, you know, all these things. And, and so now I've got this much broader perspective and, and this hindsight where I'm able to see, okay, yes, he was broken and this is how he had to function, but it has given me a lesson. You know, we learn from other people's mistakes and how it is brought into a testimony for me now to say, yes, family is our ministry. Everything else that it has to do with our life is from the overflow of that. And when our families build these walls, 
other people want to find respite behind it. And it's, it, there is something very attractive as we become the bride in this family unit that is absolutely magnetic. I know we just talked about this in a previous episode, that the love that the bride and the bridegroom have in this family setting, in the celebration, in this warring and building together, there's something very beautiful and attractive and healing about that. You know, people want to find safety in your home. I mean, I've seen it play out with my kids' friends. They love coming into our home because my home is peaceful. And I don't know what their home life is, but I'm willing to bet because, you know, my little sensors are going off that maybe their home life isn't very peaceful. And so this is why I think family is so important. God sent his one and only son, right? Family bond, a family tie in the triune God to put on display that kind of love and in a way to protect and to shore up against all the attacks of the enemy. And I I just, there's something so powerful about the family unit and how we cannot allow the Tobias, the sand ballots and the Geshems of this life to come in and distract from the very importance and the high priority that family is and should be um, in this, especially this particular moment of time and in the seasons to come. Mm-hmm. I think if we move anything on the priority list, you know, that is not it. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, and I think there, you know, it's, it's so true that in this season, there's been a lot of families under attack and not just, I mean, I would say our family has been under attack and we've seen some miraculous breakthrough and then warfare continues to happen in other areas of, you know, but, but finding our family coming together, standing shoulder to shoulder and really doing what Nehemiah had said to do of, you know, you're going to war and you're going to build and you're going to look over and you're going to protect. And, you know, Nehemiah was, you know, yes, he was in captivity. Yes. He was serving the King. He was a cupbearer to the King and he really wasn't caring about the other stuff and how he got tapped to go build the walls of Jerusalem for his nation. And his heart broke that it was in disarray and the enemy was relentless in his pursuit of really trying to stop the rebuilding of the wall, because when we rebuild the wall, there's safety and protection behind it. And that's why we have to have the family unit. I think I was kind of just kind of thinking about, um, you know, the rest of Nehemiah, it it continues to go on like Nehemiah helped the poor. And I mean, he just really modeled this servant leadership that in a lot of ways, he wasn't a leader when he was a cupbearer to the King, he was a servant. And then he stepped into this role of leading the rebuilding of the wall in record time, by the way, with a lot of opposition um, and that he stepped into that moment of pursuing what God had called on him and he stewarded that well and he cared for the families too that were there at that time with him. And we have to we have to understand that as and how we serve our families, how we minister to our families. And some of you are probably going, well, I don't have a good relationship with my family or they're toxic or they're this or they're that. Are you praying for them? I'm not saying that you have to be in relationship with toxic people or toxic members of your family, but, but is your heart set with the Lord? But some of us have chosen ministry over being present with our family and God will allow that to happen for a certain amount of time. And then he'll say, how you serve your family is how you're serving my people. And I'm not okay with this. Yeah. I think there's a lot to be said about, I mean, relationships are always free will. Okay. Got to say that every relationship is free will. That includes, you know, our children, especially as they become adult children. But even as adult children, we should be stewarding those relationships, understanding their free will, but also acknowledging if they're communicating certain things, right? Like I was estranged from my dad for off and on for a lot of years. We had a really difficult relationship, but when it was good, it was really great, you know? And so I can understand a lot of that, you know, back and forth, but I feel like there's a lot that are in ministry that are using 
you know, um, a point of contention as an excuse to kick family relationships to the curb, and they're not really stewarding them with the um, intercession and care that they should. And so you've got a lot of people who have a very bad taste in their mouth about those in ministry mm -hmm. because they, you know, like I was as a young kid, that ministry for that person is more important than me as the kid. Mm -hmm. And so you get this very bad taste in your mouth and then you, then you've caused your child. I don't care if they're an adult or a young one, you're causing them to stumble in, in perceiving God as good, good father, right? If you cannot, I mean, this is why we talked about the healing of our own, our own squatters with our healing or lack thereof, mm -hmm. how it snowballs and grows into something even more catastrophic. You're, you're demolishing your own family from within because you have placed ministry as an idol in your walls instead of your family on the altar for God to do what he wants to do in those relationships. And I believe that God is healing and turning hearts. I believe he is invading, you know, those wayward kids, those prodigal kids dreams. I believe he's, you know, invading those prodigal spouses, their dreams, the, the prodigal parents. I mean, all of these relationships that have been prodigals, I guarantee you the root of most of their pain is from religion. Mm -hmm. And it's from a mismanagement of familial relationships in correlation to ministry. And this is a very, this is a hot button for me. This is definitely a soapbox for me because I see it from 10,000 miles away. I can see it. And, and so this is really where I think God is really cranking up the fires because he is so desiring a us to decide to become the bride, but also to allow him to heal our families to bring us together so that the world can actually see that we really are different than the religious spirit that has been put on display in the past. And so there's a purity that's coming and there's a holiness that's coming to the family units. And there's a beauty and that magnetism about the walls that are being built, that there's a peace even in the midst of the warring because we're all doing it together. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it is so important that we get rid of our own excuses over pains and hurts and we begin to repent to those relationships and we begin to intercede over those relationships and we begin to steward those with a lot more care than we even do about some ministry that we seem to deem important yeah, because at the end of the day, it's family that really is the important thing. Uh, they're they're going to be the ones that are going to be standing by you, helping you to repair the walls and to repair the things that are broken in your life. And you're going to help them, too. And that's really what I mean. You know, I joke if I really knew what the Lord was saying, but in all honesty, I still would have obeyed. It makes no sense. Like, Lord, you want me to stop doing ministry to minister to my family? And yet this is my livelihood. And yet okay, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. You know, um, you know, somebody said to me, um, you know, does, does a podcast make you money? No, not one time. <laughs> you know? And so Lord, I'm trusting you, but this is the, one of the things that he said, I want you to equip my people. This is one of those things that I know that he said is I want you to equip my people and, and minister to your family. And there's some other assignments that he's given me. I mean, I mean, I'm, you know, those of you that have listened to the, you know, ministry and life update, um, from September 11th, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're missing it, go ahead, go back and you can listen to that. Um, but, but in this, we have to understand, like I was in my notes, Amy, I said this, I said, the family, our family unit, the family of God, part of us becoming the bride is realizing that there's family. Then we have our family. And then wait a second, our family is part of the bigger family. We're the family of God. And if we're going to step into becoming the bride, we have got to set the foundation about family and getting some healing where family is. And I love that this is one of your soapboxes because it's so true. I really do believe that God is, it's, it's that Joel too, right? I'm turning the hearts of the fathers towards their kids and the 
kids towards their parents. And I mean, it's that whole thing, right? And then your old men are going to dream dreams and your young men are going to prophesy and blah. It's this whole restoration process of what God is in the midst of doing right now. And it, it starts with the family unit. It starts with the families as a whole. I mean, family units as a whole have been under attack for a long time in not just in our nation, but, but around the world. But I remember when, um, Brandy was a teenager, um, Jesse was 16. So she would have been 14. Yeah. Cause I, he was learning to drive and I let him drive home from LA after we had dropped John and Brandy off at the dream center in LA. And, and John just said, he, he just came back from there and he was like, wow, this like the, the family unit is under attack. Like it was more prevalent because he had seen it being down there on Skid Row and going and ministering into places, you know, that they were allowed to go with the Dream Center in L.A. And and that's always been a part. Like when we did the church, we wanted our church to feel like a family. We wanted you to feel like you belonged because that's what Jesus was about. That's, that's what Nehemiah was about. I am coming into this place. I am rebuilding the wall of the nation of my family. I've been carried off into captivity. I don't understand it, but his heart is broken when he finds out that his people and his family is living in a place that squatters are coming in and people are stealing from them and they're not safe and his heart is rendered and it's broken and and god returned him to a nation to fix it to repair it and to bring it back and i really do believe that this is a season that prodigals are coming home things are turning around for people broken relationships that you thought you were never going to have um fixed and mended and repaired are going to be repaired. And those things that you've harbored in your heart, if you allow yourself to let go, God will heal and minister to that. Even if there isn't actual reconciliation, restoration part, there can be the reconciliation between you and God where that relationship is concerned. And so it really is about making our families part of the foundation of what we do as we go forward. Um, and part of that is we're making sure that we're removing the squatters from our life. Now, I want to talk about this, Amy. Um, anything else before I do that? I want to talk about editing our relationships. Yeah, because this will tie into that. Um, so there's kind of this picture that I've had, like, because for me, I'm like, how are these people fine with the enemy inside their walls? You know, but I think it sometimes it comes so fast and swift, and then it's just like this overtaking, right? But then I think there's things that can be like those sand ballads, the Tobias and the Gishems that are subtle and creeping in. And, and I kind of pictured a lot of these family units, you know, kind of scattered within the walls, but in their um, desire to um, self-preserve, they were fine partnering with the enemy and they would keep them fed and keep the peace, right? We weren't meant to be peacekeepers, yeah. right? We were meant to be peacemakers. And in order to be a peacemaker, we have to kick the enemy out. And so I see these people being peacekeepers because they were in self-preservation mode. Um, and part of their, you know, squatters were fear, right? And then here comes Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was just enough to get them to band together, not just with their own family unit, but with the families that were around them, right? They were side by side. The family units were side by side, warring together and building together and pulled them out of this. Um, we talked earlier about the status quo, this comfortability of keeping the peace and feeding the squatters to a place where they were bold enough to fight and kick them out. And so this is really what I, I'm seeing a lot of is, is understanding that we have our, our own, you know, family unit, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also side by side with other families. This was, you know, Jesus, this was the Acts church, you know, they were in homes, you know, Jesus, I mean, in the old Testament said, you know, what was the command, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, then Jesus came and yeah. deemed it and added to it. He said, don't worry about loving others as you love yourself, love them as I have loved you. That's a whole different mandate. And that's the 
test that's the new covenant that we're living in right mm -hmm. it's loving others as we as he's loved us not even as we've loved him it's how he has loved us yeah. sacrificially and not keeping the peace but making peace. And sometimes that making peace is war. But I really feel like there's not war in our families anymore. There's gonna be a war to, to bring the unity back, but it is gonna be very short lived because you know the scripture that you shared, you know, there are so many out there that I'm already seeing, you know, the whole I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, you know, where your sons and your daughters are prophesied, you know, you already said it. Um like I'm seeing videos of these young kids. I didn't, you know, they're testifying. Like I didn't grow up in a house. I didn't even know what a Bible was. I had never read a Bible, never heard, you know, da, 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 da. and I'm like, how are these American kids not knowing what a Bible is, you know, but it's there it's out in public. And they're sharing these testimonies. These kids unchurched, never stepped foot into a church. Don't know anything about the gospel or having dreams about walking into a bookstore and buying a Bible. Mm -hmm. There are kids, like young kids, the Gen Z, that everybody's bashing, they are hungry. And it's family people that are like on TikTok that are, you know, these kids are putting these videos out on TikTok, like, help me understand this Bible, help me understand this verse. And I'm seeing family happen in social media settings mm -hmm. where through TikTok videos, Bible studies are happening. They're kicking sand ballots out of their walls. Mm -hmm. they're, they're building a new wall and a new foundation, and they're finding family where they didn't have it. And so let, I mean, God is creating all of this, but we have to be willing to stop being comfortable with the sand ballots, the, the Tobias and the Geshems that we've been keeping the peace with and kicking them out and you know, losing those tethers yeah. that have um, kept the holes in the walls. Yeah. And not just that though, because while you were talking, I was looking up, I was paying attention to you, but I was looking for something oh, yeah. um, in the last chapter of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 13, it's Nehemiah's final reforms, right? And they read the law of Moses. Um, and so you guys go read Nehemiah. It's only 13 chapters. It won't take you long. Even if you read one chapter, it's going to take you two weeks. That's it. Or you could sit down and read a couple chapters at a time and be done in a week. It's fine. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, it's like he's saying, I wasn't even there in Jerusalem during this time when this was happening, but the priest that was in charge of the temple area and was in charge of the storerooms was closely associated with Tobiah. And he gave Tobiah a large room that was formerly used to store the grain and so guess who set up house there? Tobiah did because the priest let him in. And then it was like when all this is going on, I mean, they're reading the law of Moses and it's like, wait a second. We found that it was written that no one should be admitted to the assembly of God. Nobody should have been in the temple. Nobody should have been in that storeroom that was an Ammonite or a Moabite. And yet we have the Tobias. And here it's a family member that's closely associated with Tobiah that is letting them on in. It's exactly what you said. And they had to kick him out. And, and Nehemiah came in and he said, um, I found this out and I gave orders to purify the room and I threw all Tobias stuff out of it and said, he's not allowed to be in. This is what it means to remove the squatters from your life, right? This was a family member, somebody that was closely related, associated to the priest in the house. I mean, come on people. We have squatters. We have Tobias. We've made a safe place and a sanctuary for them with inside of our walls. And we're feeding them and giving them the place and the choice place where we're supposed to have things for the Lord. Um, about a year and a half ago, when I was doing a ministry session for somebody, um, and I was looking for a prayer for something, I came across this prayer, um, by Arthur Burke and his ministry. And in it, there's this part about um, editing our relationships with people and organizations. And I was like, okay, so let me just say this is a really dangerous prayer um, because 
it is about removing the squatters. It is about removing the people like, like Amy's analogy about the center of the dartboard. Jesus had 12 disciples. They were his family, but he had three that were in the center of the dartboard with him. And then as you went out, you had the other disciples and then you had all those people that were following him, right? We can see, and we can read how he had people in the inner circle was much smaller than the next circle, which was much smaller than the next circle. And so the analogy that Amy uses is the dartboard, right? You got the center bullseye and then you got the small circle and then the next circle and next so you got to be thinking and you have to ask some serious questions but i started and and it was about a year ago when i was ministering at a conference and i said you have to be careful who you partner with in this season like the lord is speaking to me specifically about being careful and strategic about who you're partnered with in this season, because you don't know what they're attached to. You don't know what they're allowing to happen in their life. And so if you don't know that, then you don't know what you're letting in. Okay. Not something that I wanted to like say to people, not something that I wanted to like have edited out of my life, but it is an important thing. And I realized actually it goes back to the constituents, the comrades and the confidants, right? Which one are people and they will move in and out of the circle. I think over the course of my life, um, you know, John is still in the center of my circle. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I think he would be happy to hear that he's still in the center of my circle, but the Lord has brought different people in and out of the center of my circle um, for the close people. And then even the next one and the next one. And so we have to be strategic with the Lord, right? And ask him, are these people supposed to be here? And then be daring enough, be brave enough to say to the Lord, help me to edit my relationships because sometimes we're not brave enough to do it on our own. We need the Lord to help us with that. Um, and I started praying that prayer and let me just tell you it, it, it's a hurtful prayer sometimes because you're like, wait, that person is okay being edited out of my life. But when you realize that you pray this prayer before the Lord and you ask him to edit, edit your relationships and edit your relationships with organizations too, right? Because you don't know what all they're involved with. And then you find out, Oh goodness. And I was associated with that. I was attached to that. That's letting the enemy come on in. I mean, Nehemiah says here in chapter 13, I didn't know that the priests gave him a room for this in the storehouse for all of his stuff. And it was being defiled and it was being used by Tobias. So I kicked him out and then we had to purify it. So there's things and people that, um, that they're not bad, but they just aren't supposed to be in the side, the walls with us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, like you said, that's going to be a, a brave and tough prayer that you have to, you gotta mean it, you know, because you saying it, means that you're going to partner with the Lord to actually walk it out, right? This isn't like genie in a bottle. God's just going to, you know, move people out. You're going to have to do some things. You, you're probably going to have to have some hard conversations. Now, I do think that God will just kind of quietly, you know, let the paths split. You know, there's like that fork in the road that just happens sometimes and naturally, conversations begin to space out and there's no ill will. There's no ill meaning. You know, you're blessing these people into everything that God has for them, but you're also understanding that you can't go with them and they can't go with you. And so sometimes it just quietly happens and sometimes not so much. So, yeah, I mean, you have to be willing to walk it out Yeah, and it's, it's not fun, but it is absolutely necessary if you truly desire to move forward, right? Because only your, only your family, only your ride or dies, those bullseye people, mm -hmm. only they are capable of warring and building with you in the pure godly way that needs to happen in this particular moment of time and in the seasons to come. Yeah. Because I think the church is in a building season. It, 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 I know this feels contrary to what you're seeing in the natural, what you might be watching play out um, in our nation. Right. But God is calling his people to build in this season and it's in the midst of warfare. And we don't like to build in the midst of warfare. We just want to put our, put our mind to building. We don't want to be interrupted by the, 
I got to battle this. I got to pray about this. I got to No, we just want to build. We just want to put our head down and do this stuff. But, but we see here with Nehemiah, they had to learn and they did both at the same time. First, they had to remove the squatters and put them outside the walls. And then they got taunted and they got all the stuff coming at them, but at least they're outside of the walls and they were still warring. They were still battling and they were still building. And the church is in this place where we have got to start taking action of doing the things God is calling us to do. We have to start building. We have to start taking action. And it's in the midst of warfare that the church is going, the church is going to thrive. We have the answers in the midst of warfare that people are going through. We have the answers, but we got to start building. We've got to be a people of action. I remember when John, one of the, one of his sermon titles was Nehemiah, a man of action. Nehemiah was a man of action. I mean, all the way through from Nehemiah one to Nehemiah 13, he's telling my final reforms are I purified the house of God because somebody let Tobiah in there and he had a place, even though I put him outside the wall, he still had a place inside. So we have to be aggressive. It goes to that, you know, Romans 12, one and two, right. About, um, renewing our mind, renovating our mind. When we renovate a house, it's an aggressive process of ripping things out and putting new things in. And so we as a church are at that place now. And, um, so Amy, any final thoughts before I give the activation homework for this week? No, no, no. Okay. Okay. All right. So be thinking, I'm going to give homework, but I want you to pray us out for this. Um, and before I give the homework though, can you tell people how they can connect with you? How can they can sew into your ministry, um, and all the places to find you? Yeah. Just, um, one-stop shop on my website. It's ronrealministries.com all spelled out and all the fun stuff is there. Perfect. All of the fun stuff. I like that. All of the fun stuff is there. Okay. So Amy, you're going to pray us out in a minute, but here's, here's the activation exercises for this week to help us to remove the squatters. And the first one came from Amy, actually. So Amy, I stole one of your questions. Um, yeah. And that is what am I allowing to squat in the place that I'm to build? Because we're all called to build. We're all called to build. There's something that needs to be built. There's something that God is calling us to in this season. So what am I allowing to squat in the place I'm to build? Take that before the Lord and really rend your heart before the Holy Spirit and say, show me what I'm allowing to squat in here. Um, and then, of course, you know, you need to take care of removing it aggressively because that needs to be outside of the wall that you're fortifying with the Lord and your family on the inside. Okay. And then the next one, be brutally honest about your current relationships and ask God to edit your relationships or to help you edit your relationships. Um, that is a, a dangerous, but much needed prayer. It's one of those things that I've been surprised at the relationships that God has edited from my life. And yet I now see that they're necessary. And I think that when I started praying that prayer, when the first relationships got it, got to be edited out, I was like, I took it personal. I took it like rejection. And then the Lord's like, can we deal with the spirit of rejection again, Debbie? Because you just prayed this prayer that you asked for my help to edit relationships. And now you're thinking that they're rejecting you. And it's all about you when you just asked me to do this. So be prepared and prepare your heart, people, that when you ask the Lord to edit your relationships, that he's going to do that and don't take it personal. And hopefully the other people don't take it personal either. It doesn't mean that you can't, you know, have conversations. It just means you can't have them in the inner circles, um, the inner two circles, I'm going to say, right. They can be on the outside. They can still, you can still have your relationship has to change though, because you're allowing them to be squatters. So you have to edit your relationships. Um, and they're more harmful for you than you realize. I, I, I realize that now that he's been editing some relationships and it's not always easy, but if you trust him in the process, it's worth it. It's worth it. So again, your homework, Ask the question, what am I allowing to squat in the place that I'm to build? And be brutally honest with yourself about your current relationships and ask God to edit or help you edit your relationships. So with that, Amy, could you pray us out of the podcast today? Absolutely. 
Holy Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this conversation. We thank you for this invitation uh, to step into this place to build and uh, to be purified and to rearrange things in our lives uh, to partner with you better. Lord, help us to see things uh, that we may not want to look at and help us to hear the things that we may not want to hear. May we be bold and brave enough to step into this place of obedience, to play, to step into this place of surrender. Um, and Lord, I just ask that you strengthen everybody's hands as they um, begin to pick up their sword and they begin to pick up their hammer as we begin to build and war in this season with you, Lord. And we just thank you that you are... Um, bringing reconciliation the way you bring it, that we may not um, decide what that looks like, but we let you show us what that looks like, Lord, that your reconciliation, your restoration of our hearts, of our families, of our relationships, and of the walls um, that you have had us build uh, to surround us, these boundaries that are protecting us so that we can step forward into the greater vision of becoming your bride, Lord, and building the things here on this earth that you have tasked us to do. May we be bold and brave and resilient, Lord. I just thank you for your strength. I thank you for your joy in the midst of this, that um, as things become a little bit painful, that your healing balm is there and your strength is there, Lord. And I just thank you and I praise you for all of these things that you've set before us, for these conversations that have challenged us, Lord, that we can step up higher. We can go further with you in this moment of time and in the seasons to come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Amy, thank you for another great podcast episode. If I do say so myself, um, I really like, like Nehemiah, there's so many life lessons from him and, um, it's time to get rid of those squatters once and for all, because it really is about moving forward. And even though I'm not doing the possessing the promised land, that is very much on God's heart right now about us building and about us repairing and about us moving forward to begin to possess the promises that he has for for us so don't worry people it'll happen sometime next year but in the meantime um i want to thank you for listening to dare to hear the podcast I want to thank you for joining amy and i week after week if you've missed any go back and listen to them um i just pray that this has encouraged you and challenged you because that's what we set out to do but could you do us a favor could you share this episode out so that we can uh spread the word and spread the love because it's so important for us to be a, a become the bride that we begin to start doing the things that God is calling us to do so that we ourselves as individuals can get healed and whole so that we can partner with the rest of the body of Christ to usher in Christ's return. And so I just thank you guys for being with us, Amy. Thank you again. Um, Thank you guys for listening to Dare to Hear the Podcast. If you are at a place where you can like us, leave us a review or follow us. We would love for you to do that. Share this out. And until next week and another episode on Becoming the Bride series, God bless and goodbye. Says me.